Good morning. I'll just do a sound check. Can you hear me on the mic? Can you hear me properly? Yes, I suggest. Is it clear? Okay, thank you. Good to go? Just stay down. Good morning. I welcome everyone present and joining online to today's hearing of the York Justice Commission. Today we commence a further round of hearings focused on the priority areas of the child protection system and the criminal justice system. Over the next week and a half, the Yaruk Justice Commission will hear from community members who have personally experienced these systems or seen family members go through them. We'll, we'll hear directly about the effects that those experiences have had on them, their families and their community. The Commission will hear some evidence also from key service providers, First Peoples, representative bodies and other key stakeholders. For many participants, there is an inevitable trauma in telling their story. It is also an opportunity for unburdening and healing. I thank all witnesses for their strength, bravery and leadership in coming forward to give evidence to the Yurok Justice Commission. The important work in this hearing block follows on from the December hearings. The Commission was privileged to hear from other from Aboriginal community controlled organisations, service providers and other professionals and advocates on these key priority areas. Commissioners enter this February hearing block, also known as hearing block four, having recently visited a number of Victorian prisons, witnessed and heard firsthand the crossover between these systems, the impacts on individuals and families, and the lack of adequate culturally appropriate services and supports. Before we start today's hearing, I would like to invite Commissioner Hunter, Hunter to give a welcome to country and acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Chair Burke. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're streaming today from Uruk, from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, my people. Um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge, uh, particularly today, um, Arnie Eunice in, in her evidence coming forward by the, the Wright family, um, but also all those elders out there and all those that have come before us to fight for justice uh, and lend their voices to, to the Commission. So, uh, Wilma Jekka. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Hunter. I agree. I... I we thank the Wright family for the experience that we've had in hearing their stories and um, we're grateful for their coming forward. So, Council. Commission, please, as I appear with Mr McAvoy to assist. If the Commission pleases, Ms Caffarella on behalf of the State of Victoria. Good morning. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Chair. Today, Uruk resumes its hearing and continues its focus on the child protection and criminal justice systems. As you noted, Chair, over the next week and a half, our focus is on hearing the personal stories and truth of First Peoples individuals and families that have been through or had to deal with uh, these systems. We expect that this will, at times, be difficult to hear and the individual witnesses, uh, for them, it can be a very traumatic experience to talk about these issues. We're deeply grateful to each individual giving evidence and recognise their role in helping Uruk to understand the effects of these systems. We thank them um, for their courage and willingness to stand up and tell their story and contribute their voices to a growing evidence base that we need to inform findings and recommendations for future change. We also recognise that there are individuals and community members that have contributed their stories via equally important means. 
including in recent times, participation in roundtables, the Commissioner's recent prison visits, through submissions and through their work with solicitor assistings to prepare outlines of evidence that will be tendered throughout this hearing block. While there is a clear crossover between community experiences within the child protection and criminal justice systems, and a number of our witnesses will speak to both systems, in general terms, this week we'll be hearing primarily from witnesses that have lived experience of the child protection system, and next week the focus will be on witnesses with lived experience of the criminal justice system. Uruk will be taking the evidence sensitively, with breaks as needed, and social and emotional wellbeing supports on hand. Given the sensitivities of their evidence and some of the legal restrictions around hearing evidence involving children, parts of our hearings will be closed and we'll be seeking sensitivity orders to redact certain identifying information. The purpose of this is to protect the children involved and their families. We note that for the media watching, there is a media guideline that has been published on Europe's website to assist you in navigating the legal framework relevant to media reporting on these issues. Before we commence today, um, I note that the Chair has made orders under Section 24 of the Inquiries Act today. The orders seek to permit, or the orders permit at Europe's discretion over this entire hearing block part or all of a witness's evidence to be led in a closed hearing, whereby members of the public, parties with leave and or all non-essential staff to appear are requested to leave the hearing room. Uruk's live stream is paused and or the relevant evidence is omitted from published video recordings. The grounds for making the orders are section 24 1 B, D and E of the Inquiries Act 2014, Victoria, namely, a Commissioner may make an order excluding any person from a proceeding of the Royal Commission if the nature and subject matter of the proceeding is sensitive, or the conduct of the proceeding would be more efficient and effective, or the Commission otherwise considers the exclusion appropriate. <coughs> uh, Chair, you have made those orders this morning. I make those orders in the terms sought. First witnesses we'll hear from this morning are the Wright family, Donna, Tina, Joanne and Sunny Wright. This evidence will take place by video, recently pre-recorded on country at the former Lake Condor Mission. We acknowledge the contribution of Donna, Tina, Joanne and Sunny Wright and the leadership and strong advocacy of Auntie Eunice Wright. Before the video is played, can I note that at some point around 11.30, I'll be inviting the Commission to take a break in the playing of the video, and then we'll resume to finish off the video after the mid-morning break. Could I ask that the video be played now? Thank you. Okay. Well, shall we make a start then? Yeah. 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 Commissioner, if you wanted to... Uh, look, I, I just wanted to uh, thank... Uh, Inishmara Mob for having us here today. Thank you very much for smoking. It's great to come back and visit here. Mm. I haven't been down this way for I don't know how long and mm. driving here on my own was a challenge anyway because I've always been driven here. Mm. <laughs> so, and I thought, my God, this is embarrassing. <laughs> but it, we're here. That's yes. the main thing. So thank you very much. And uh, um, <clears throat> I'd just like to acknowledge your family and... Mm. I remember your mother from the opening of the First People's Assembly mm. uh, on that first day, so I was privileged to see her then, which uh, I'll always remember. Uh, but I'd like to acknowledge <coughs> Joanne, um, Donna, Tina and Joanne and uh, your brother in yeah. absentia, Sonny, uh, because this is your family's story and we're looking forward to hearing from her. Uh, you about the story that happened in this place and um, we thank you for the hospitality today as well. So thank you very much. Um, so um, I'd also like to acknowledge country, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the Lichmara as a Ewan man from the south east coast of New South Wales and pay my respects to those ancestors, to your ancestors and 
who still inhabit this land and I can mm. feel them already today and, um, and, and um, so thank you. Um, I can feel all of the people who aren't in this room who are actually in this room mm. right now um, supporting you um, to tell your truth. Um, so we really thank you for your generosity of spirit uh, having us here today. Um, so really, today is is your day, mm. rather than ours, um, to to tell your truth, and um, and so um, really invite you to do that in any way that you wish, and however you wish, and wherever you wish. Um, uh, uh, so um, maybe first we can just start with each of you introducing yourselves uh, and mm. your story, and then telling us about this place. Um. Donna Wright, um, so I'm the eldest daughter of Eunice and um, James Wright, Jimmy Wright, as he was well known down there. But mum was a foster, she's um, an Arden, so this is where mum was, she lived and she was raised and yeah, and that we've been a part of all of her life and mum's kept, kept us connected to this place. Um, Tina. I'm second born. I um, <laughs> had the privilege of caring for mum the last three years of her life. Mm. Um, pretty heartbreaking to be here and she's not here. Mm. So I'm probably going to be emotional. Mm. And I made a promise to her at her funeral that I would not give up the fight for justice. Her just continue that work that she started. Um, got three children, two good kids, one naughty one, <laughs> um, and six grandbabies in my life. Hi, I'm Joanne. Um, I'm the baby daughter. Um, mm. I was actually born in Warrnambool. Mm. These two were born in New South Wales. Mm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think it's so important that we get to speak mum's story and you know, how not only did she pass the stories on to us, but to our children and our grandchildren. Mm. My, I've got seven grandchildren and they will know the story and, you know, they'll pass it on to their generation. So, yeah, I mm. think, thank you for giving us this opportunity you know, to mm. speak. Yeah. And it's, and thanks, Tina and Joe, because, um, you know, I'm a mother of three sons. I've raised them and they're connected, but also have ten grandchildren who absolutely, I remember mum saying to my granddaughter, um, mum and dad purchased a property in Brankshome just up the road and mum said, are you coming to um, Brankshome, Naya? And she said, no, no nan, I'm going to the mission. She wants to live on the mission. She knows all the stories. Um, but this is our kids' safe, happy, happy place where we can all come together as a family um, and just, you know, just be here and... Um, on our country with our family, like it, like it should be. I feel like it's important that we speak the names of her mum and dad, mum and mum's brothers and sisters, for mm. the, the record. And we've got their photos over here. Yes. Mm. So I'd like to acknowledge my auntie Letty, my grandmother, Royal mm. Foster, the letter Foster, Gloria Foster, mm. my grandfather, Monty Foster, my Uncle Ronnie Foster, my two grandmothers, great-grandmothers, Granny Arden and Granny Foster, who lived in that, who yeah, passed up in the, the dormitory. Mm. So I think that's important because it's not only about that, it's mum's story that she mm. brought with them. Mm. Yes. yes, Arden's a big name in yeah, the yeah. south coast, a very yeah. big name. Mm. Yes. Huge, eh? Yes, yes. And we were only talking about the Ardens mm. and how many family yes. groups have married yes. into... That's the other thing, the connections. Just mm. everything, just went everywhere. Yes, yep. right across through to Horsham, mm. down this way, Fran. Mm. Um, and we still have those connections, eh? Mm. Yeah. But, you know, that's the foster family, that photo. Mm. It's the only together. one we have. We didn't have the privilege. Well, Mum never had lost mm. everything. So that grainy... You see those children? Mm. Those healthy, clean, fat 
children and that happy family. And I use those words there because I thought they were, I need, needed to, I wasn't going to use them, but I thought, no, I've got to use them. Um, mm. You know, the words like murdered mm. because that's how I feel, this government, about this government. Mm. I um, <clears throat> feel like the government pissed on our family tree. So, and I, I need to hold them accountable in whatever justice you can help us seek. It was a fight. We should start from mum being removed. But, you know, that photo, Tina, you know, those... We have all these beautiful, happy memories. We have these amazing stories of our families and our connections and, and this place and to different places and where our grandparents lived. Um, we've slept in that dormi dormitory, 22 of us, just with candles and a generator and fed our kids. And um, we've walked along this creek and there's the cummock at the back where, so we know these old stories that um, our families, so that's important. Because mum made sure um, we knew those stories and she shared those stories. And they're our stories from our grandparents mm. and our, uh, our grandmother and our aunties and uncles that we cherish and our kids know. So we honour them and respect them and make sure they know who they are, who they belong to, their country. Um, you know, it's really important. But um, to have to live this beautiful life, you know, you... They lived off the land, you know, we're talking when we couldn't, our mom couldn't access food, our family, um, but they were hard workers, but they absolutely loved and cherished their children. Um, there was a lot of families in this area that, um, because our family was the last family to live on this mission, and by taking um, the children, mum, Uncle Ronnie and Uncle Raw, Whilst my grandmother was in hospital, terminally ill with TB, my grandfather was working. This land was given as um, return soldier packages. But when our grandmother come home, um, she said her house was burnt down and she didn't know where her children were. Her eldest daughter, Amy Lady Hutina mentioned, um, was the only child that didn't get taken. This was to the white returned soldiers, wasn't it? Mm. The, 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 not ours. Yes, that's right. Yeah, but not it's ours. important to say that on the record because mm. a lot of people mm. don't understand oh, that. Okay. That's a, you know that's a double theft when you think about it. From so all the beautiful memories is back that families create. You know, growing up and um, picking blackberries and running around, running amok here and with all their cousins and family. You know, that's that's the beautiful life they had here. And that all changed after that, after that day. And we just, mum got her record, so it was the 3rd of June in 1954, but some of the horrible stuff for mum is, um, through her life was records, they changed her name, they changed her date, date of birth, our grandparents' name. And she was coming home from school, hey? They'd come home from school and mm. was, was it only Ollie's house that she, yeah. she went to? And his grandfather was working in Yambuck and Graham was um, in hospital. And then the police car come. So it was Haywood police that come. Stop, and stop. What was his name? Stop. It's in the records that yeah. we, it's there. But, um, How old were they? How old were they? Mum was nine. Uncle Ronnie was six. Yeah. And they've even got the ages wrong, you know, like the the way our mob was treated and just even... How old was Uncle Ronnie? She was about 12, going on 13, because she was about 13 when she got money. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, is there a human rights injustice there when you lock babies in cells? Mm. Yes. But when she was, they were having their afternoon tea, they were, um, you know, hard enough for your mum being in hospital. Mm. But um, they were safe and loved and cared for and getting fed and that's when the police car come and 
mum said she was she's put in the car. I don't know where Ronnie Gore was at the time, but mum was saying she was in the police car and um, her little brother, Uncle Ronnie, was with Auntie Phyllis. That's our grandfather's sister, Auntie Phyllis Saunders. She was a foster. And they went to her house and she'd already, she had him hidden Uncle Ronnie under the bed and told the police that he wasn't there. And that police officer who Tina's talking about said, well, if you don't tell us where Ronnie is, we're going to come and take your children. Mm -hmm. So she's, and Uncle Ronnie was under the bed, so he had to get in the police car. And that's when, I don't know where Ronnie Glaw was, but they were taken, the three of them were taken to the Haywood Police Station down here. And um, there's a police record that we've given to you, Rook, that records um, the reasons why, you know, they took the children, because they were loved and they were happy and they were cared for, you know. There was just all of these blatant lies on that form about our grandfather, um, which is horrible to read. And then whilst, um, when they were, in, they were put in the cells at um, Haywood Police Station, and then the magistrate, they had the hearing, I think it was on the same day, according to their records as well. So it's all the laws and the procedures to legally um, steal kids and then make decisions about their lives that affect them for the rest of their lives and their families, so... Well, the Protection Act was still yes. sort of uh, the hangover and I think it was 1957 that the Welfare Act came into being in Victoria, mm. but the behaviours, it kept the same behaviours because they set up the department to keep being in uh, control of what was happening with Aboriginal people's children. And if you look at that police report, that's, this is <coughs> Mum's file we've got. This is a file that she... Um, they're her records. And you have a look at some of the information on there and it talks about... Um, it was a child... Uh, um, the police form. And it just asks about the character of our grandparents. And you've got a bit of a writing there and, and it's just... It's absolutely shocking and horrible to read because there's a section on there that says, um, what was it about the drinking? This is on an official government form of the day about alcohol use. Um, and you had those options as a government worker or police officer, whoever you were, to describe the attitude and the behaviour of the parents. So all these lies that are written on that form. So it's absolutely disgusting to read. Um, because our grandparents were good people, they were hard working people. They loved their children, they lived and breathed for them. But And then that police record is under the Criminal Act, it says on the top of the paper that we give to Emily, to you, Rook. Um, and it's just shocking to read these comments about our grandparents. And then um, the magistrate's decision. But our family was there at court that day, we had aunties and uncles and we had family members in in their uh, in their defence uniforms, you know, saying these kids are being looked after by extended family. Yeah, um, the um, Lovett brothers, do you mm. know the Lovett brothers? Mm. They went mm. to court in uniform, mm. full uniform, and said we'll take the kids. Does it say in that work, in any way court transcripts. Why? don't even know if there's a don't transcript. Know. This is like the final decision procedural thing for the court. So whether there was transcripts or... Mum's always said that um, they said the judge said I don't know if it's official but Mum always said that they refused to allow the kids to live them because they only wanted the one pound endowment. Mm. It was all about money. Yeah. yeah. So that was... Kids. That was Sorry. the other lies. I don't think that would have been true. No. Because, because they love Gran and our grandfather, or that, that was his sister. Mm -hmm. And her husband. That come to court, you just don't come for the money. Like yeah. The rations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the decision was made, wasn't it? That, you know, there's just a... There's there was already, already 
already done. You, you didn't matter how many people showed up for that court. Mm. Yeah, because you know, like, it's so racist down here in the southwest, mm. uh, especially um, you know, being the first. I don't know what you're going to call it, colony set, set up in Victoria, but you know, that affected our, you know, that hurt our families and destroyed our families, really. Well, you know, white people that came in had other ideas, didn't they? It was disgusting. Mm. Some, I could just, some of the things on this form and the words that are written, because after the decision was made by the magistrate, that um, basically. You know, we don't even know if Mum and that were well, obviously wards of the state. There's no official written term, but um, they would be sent to Ballarat orphanage. So, you know, Mum remembers being in that cell with her sister and her brother, nine, six, and I reckon only Bill might have been twelve, though, because she was seventeen when she. And all they did was cry. Yeah. They cried and cried and cried, yeah. cried all the way to train station, they cried all the way to... Mm. Um, and they got on a train with the police officer, the woman. Yeah. My mum said she felt like a criminal. She, everyone was looking at her like, you know, these these mm. little kids with the, the police and policemen mm. taking them. Mm. Like, she felt like, yeah, treated like a criminal. Mm. To um, Royal Park, mm. which I don't know if it's Tirana now or... It's a mm. It was a receiving centre. It was for kids. Yeah. And then I mean, they were separated there yeah. from the baby brother, which was so traumatic for them. She we, cried all night, she said, and they'd come together for about playtime. They must have had a playtime in there. And Uncle Ronnie and they'd meet at the fence and they'd kiss each other. Mm. And um, that was for about a month, wasn't it? Yeah, we looked at the date, so we went through all Mum's record and just trying to work out. She, They were there at Royal Park for about three weeks because it was July, they ended up at Ballarat Children's Orphanage. Um, so that's a long time to be in a place like that. Is that a detention centre? can't imagine how they were treated. Separation traumatised <coughs> Mum all her life from her brother. Mm. She always spoke about it. And it's speaking to him through the fence. That was only an hour a day, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah it was something yep. like that. Yeah. Mm. So we didn't know what happened to them during that time, you know, and, you know, they'd, they'd come from here safe and loved and happy into that, into that environment where they're just treated like, not even humanely, but you know, this system starts now changing their identity mm -hmm. and, and absolutely changing their identity. They become, that information's on a criminal record. They are now these other children. They're not Eunice and mm -hmm. Ronnie and Gloria. Mm -hmm. um, Monty Foster and Lyle Foster's kids, they live up the mission and all of those beautiful stories and memories. They're now this piece of paper um, that that government and that protection board used to change their identity and who they were. Um, disgusting comments. Um, there was a lot of family in Ballarat Orphanage by the mum and that got there, but um, the system's not only traumatised, it's just that it's a, the cruelty. You know, how the cruel... terror. We well, need to use that word, the terror, mm -hmm. because that's... Mm. As children, wouldn't, wouldn't you imagine being a six-year-old, a nine-year-old, how terrified you'll be, you don't know nobody, nobody loves you, mm -hmm. you're not going to feel any more love after that. And those records, that identity, then it starts um, record not only their, their, their identity, but physical and all of those traits. So, you know, obviously our... Um, family, you know, mum's dark skin, she's very healthy, she was a good girl, they spoke about their character and all of those things, but then coming from Royal Park, where they made records there, there's all these other comments. And three weeks later, there's all these other comments. So already this system is describing them 
in a disgusting, inhumane way. Well, Latifah good. Yeah. She's not healthy. underweight, she's healthy. Mm. But she was loved and cared for and she was happy, but... And then this system then changes their identity and who they are. And so maybe they gave her a bath and put some clean clothes on her and that mm. made them look at her differently. I don't... Yeah. But it's the comments on those records that are hurtful and shocking to see, you know, like his mum and our grandmother never... aunties and uncles never spoke about this. Yeah. We only found out about this at the... Um, when the inquiry was happening um, into the... They call it removal. Aboriginal children, we call it stealing, kidnapping, whatever. Mm. But mum's um, evidence is in the Bring Them Home report. And we was, yeah. were sitting there at the um, public hearings and mum was saying, tell them what happened. And I said, what happened, mum? And I, I think I was in my 30s. And um, I said, what happened, mum? So that's how her story started getting shared. But... Um, but we were loved. We got to, as hard as Mum's life was, she met Dad, you know, absolutely fell in love and had her children and we were loved and cared for her for Mum when she was a little girl. She didn't have any of that. And once she got out to the, her and Uncle Ronnie and Auntie Gore got to Ballarat because Auntie Gore got separated and sent to Win Leighton Girls Home. So that was really hard. And it's when they got there at the Ballarat Orphanage, there's another record of their identity, their appearance and, you know, their character and whatever. So this whole system is documenting and recording our mother and our family in the most derogatory, disgusting, offensive way. Mm -hmm. So today is about honouring them because they were beautiful people who just loved us and mm. looked after us. Mm. But we need to um, tell their truth. So they were there for a while. Um, Mum was 17 before she left the... We have to go into the slave labour, though. Orphanage. Yeah, go, Tina. That's... She, um, when she got to the orphanage, and I think the orphanage would have been able to run without all mm. their little slaves, her mum went straight to work. Um, she'd make the beds in the morning, and she bathed the babies at night. Mm. How, how old was she at that stage? Nine. 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 Wow. Yeah. So that was her job. Mm. And there was lots of other kids. You know, you, you're talking about hundreds of kids. Kids in, in a dormitory. This is a Ballarat. 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 Can I just quickly ask? Mm. You said there was other family there. So the Uncle Lloyd uh, Clark. Uncle Lloyd. So there was a heap of. There was a so few. some kids, yeah, Kennedy from here. Yeah. All the Edwards was there, Kennedy and his family. That says a lot. Mm. Yeah. But uh, Teddy, do you, you know Teddy Lovett? Yeah, he's yeah. been there. He, he yeah. was there. He, yeah. uh, after reconciliation became a thing, Aye. Uh, there was a, some, uh, I, I don't know what he did, but there might be something in writing about um, what was said at the time um, when they were trying to get some kind of, um, I don't know, acknowledgement about all of this stuff. Uh, mm. He was very concerned about the orphanage and, because he's getting on too now. Mm. But I just don't know what the outcome, I was working with the council and I'm sure there would have been some statements made that would be of interest to yeah. you that might be a little bit more general, but it was still about the um, removal of children yep. in, in, in a whole bolus there. Yeah, a lot of mum's cousins, you know, um, they could have been before mum, mm. you know, the families, mm. because there was a lot of families yes. living here yes. at the time. Yes. So mum, our family, was the last family to live on, on the machine. Auntie, what's her name in Ballarat? Still alive. Uncle Lloyd's sister. Yeah. Auntie Nancy. Auntie Nancy, Nancy Clark. Clark. Mm. And her brother were there. Yes. Um, which is Grand's, which is, who's, who, how, what's the connection? On the grandfather's side. Foster's. Grandfather's Foster's. sister. Yeah, yeah. Foster's. We're taken, yeah. So both sides of our family, you know. So all the cousins, so. So you'd be happy to see them. Mm. And then mum had to make a life there, what she could. She'd have to be. 
you had to find some kind of happiness. And that what you're talking about, Tina, the work and but also, you know, mum had to look after babies and little kids. She was a little child herself. Mm. And we'd lost um, an auntie, Glennis, our grandparents um, had a fifth um, baby girl, Glennis, but she passed away at three months of age. Um, I don't know the age difference there between mum and that, but still, you know, you've lost a baby sister. Mm. And then you're a child mm. and you're looking after other children, traumatised children, crying mm. children, in, and hundreds of crying children. And you're traumatised yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't know where your brother is and your sister in school and you don't know where your mother is and your father is. And also, Mum was saying one of the things that used to happen, they'd get up in the morning and um, they'd have to get ready and, and make their beds, but if there was any children who wet the bed, um, there was, um, you know, they got in trouble for punishment. that. Well, there was be punishment for that. But what Mum and that used to do, they'd go around and hide the sheets and just make the beds mm. for the kids. Just for a hiding sheet. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And yet they were doing laundry. So mum ran away one time trying to come home and um, she had to scrub the floors. When she come back, because once she was in the um, orphanage, they said she was a good girl and they did sports and they tried to have a normal life, but they were still, they had to work mm. and they were paid wages. And But... Um, I was doing her hair one day and um, putting it in a ponytail and um, there's this big scar on the back of her head. And I said, Mum, what's, what's that? What happened there? And she went really, really quiet. Oh, she goes, oh, that's where um, I hit my head. I'm, and, you know, not knowing, I'm going, Why, what happened, Mum? Just brushing her hair and I just remember her being really quiet. And she said... Um, I lost my ribbon for her hair and she got in trouble and the punishment was her head being rammed into a steel coat hook mm. and this scar um, on her head, she'd never re she didn't receive medical attention mm. because the scar wouldn't be like that. If you went to a doctor or a hospital, you would have had that um, stitches. stitches, no, just a big gaping scar <laughs> on the back of her head. And, just little things in our daily life like that would pop mm. up. But, um, and then telling us about scrubbing the floor when she tried to run away because she just wanted to come home and she she just went in the wrong direction. She went on the wrong highway. Mm. Yeah. She headed to Horsham mm. instead of, mm. and she, and she, they, where'd they get her? At a milk bar or something. Yeah. yeah. Someone gave them a lift, eh? And they. Yeah. She hitchhiked up towards Horsham because you know how got the Henty Highway coming down here. Mm. She got on the. The Horsham Highway. Mm. But she's trying to get home. So when she started sharing this, because it was never spoken about, and um, it, it might have popped up in a conversation, we said, what happened, Mum? You know, tell us about um, when you ran away. So there was a plan. There was a plan hatched between the young kids. I don't know who else was with her. But what they did was they had their lunches. They would go to school in their uniform, and they had their lunches all packed. But they didn't go to school. So off they went on their journey to come home. And she goes, we didn't... She had a bit of a giggle about it too, so I would speak, you know, for her... She's not fainting. She, <laughs> she, um, she goes, we had our lunch. We had our lunch straight away. They were hungry, you know, kids. Yeah. Kids love Tucker. But, um, yeah, and then it was hot one day. Mm. And they end up getting a lift from someone. Mm. And they end up in a shop or something, eh? And he bought him a pie. And she was sitting there, and that's when the police come in the, mm. into the shop. Mm. And she knew straight away. So okay. after they got picked up and taken back by the police. So you can imagine the system, mm. you know. Um, you know, how did, how did the rounding up of kids who, who were trying to go home, you know, um, the police, you know, they're still doing it today, but yeah. um, the fact that she got taken back and that's when she said the next day she was on her hands and knees scrubbing the floors, that was her punishment. Mm. And also, um, 
Uncle Ronnie, he was about 13, I think, and he was off working on a farm. So, you know, he'd been there for a while. But he come back from work one day and he'd had a broken jaw. Mm. And the farmer, the farmer hit him. We don't know what that story is, but we want to, for him, for Uncle Ronnie, we want to find out um, what happened to him. And we want, there should be some records and we'd want Yurok to investigate why there was no medical records kept of our mum and Uncle Ronnie, how, how was his jaw broken? Where are those medical records? They're in the care of the state And that facility. could be easily um, explained away because he worked in a milking with cows. Mm. Was mm. he a mother at two? Yeah. yeah. Mm. How old was he before that? Around that age? Six. Oh, when he was went to work. Yeah. Th he was thirteen. Yeah. Mum said when that happened. Yeah. But we don't know how he was treated. So he, these are so not only were the little slaves looking after the kids and cleaning the orphanage, they were billeted. They were billeted out to farmers to run um, farms and um, bring in their cows and milk and all of this and milk them. And if he'd been working there, we don't know where he was working. How come he had a broken jaw and where is his medical records? My grandmother, there's nothing... Uncle Ronnie must have... He will have a different file. Mm. And there's letters from Ballarat Orphanage to my grandmother. Mum had nephritis. Um, there's no letter to tell her about this injury, a head injury. But, um, you know, Dr Google, you look and you, mm. that's a kidney um, illness. She's really sick and um, she had to go to hospital. So she she got really, they got really sick there and they were treated really badly there. So we want your book to investigate. But do you think there are medical records somewhere? We, we don't know, Maggie, you know, mm. we, um, Commissioner, we would um, think that they would mm. have They'll those. They'll be keeping paperwork. They yeah. might. Yeah, you're, 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 you're a black this, mm -hmm. you're this mm -hmm. and you're this, because it's written there. I don't want to disrespect my mother in saying any of those words. Yeah. Um, but certainly we could ask the state, yeah, um, are exactly. there records, uh, health records or other records from these mm. places? I, I'm because just wondering if there's any record, health records on anything. Yeah. Well, I, they mightn't be health. They'll be called welfare. They'll be mm. called something else. Mm. There'll be another. Mm. Yeah. But it's yeah. knowing where to look because it would be a part of a. We also yeah. we also justification want... to keep them. Yeah, where I was just they wondering are. if that, those if there was other injuries that they'd sustained that were on the records. You know, are there are there is actually anything? Are there records there? from the door, um the orphanage? Yeah. Do they have records? Well, this is well, what the, we don't we've got know. All Mum's bowel, Tina, has got records of when she went there. Yeah. And then her wages well, that's from when the she's orphanage, yeah, it? that's from oh. the orphanage. But how? And there's a letter. There's letters to, to Gran to say that your daughter's sick in hospital. Mm -hmm. But there's also, and you know what address was on that? Her address was um, she was living with the Pratt family, so the Pratts in Kew. She, she was our grandmother was their domestic. Um, Helper, she was working, and uh, she said that fam the Pratt family um, treated her well, but she was working here in Melbourne to get her children back and writing letters, and she had to prove that she was a good mother. She had a stuck, she had a home to bring them home to. She was in um, Collingwood initially, but the letter about mum going to hospital was sent to the Pratt house, so she might have been living with the Pratts. Mm -hmm. We don't even know. We'd love to know if they had photos or yeah, they, anything. Yeah, Gran used to say that they used to make her eat at the, at the table. table with them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they loved her. Yeah. Mm. Rats. So I have OCD and can't stop cleaning, and I think I'm proud that's my grandmother's trait. But <laughs> to go through them and see all these little connections, mm. but um, so there could be a connection made now to the. What did she disclose yeah. to the Pratt family? Yeah. Um, because it's a middle class, I'll have photos. Hey, exactly. You yeah. know, we'd love some photos of Elle. Mm. Because she worked hard, eh, Grant? Mm. Mm. All her life. Um, and we're lucky that um, we grew up with our beautiful grandmother. But for those medical records, they're not in mum's file. So she obviously... And we all know if you get an injury to your head, that's, that, that it's a... The, 
bleeding is profuse. Mm. Mm. So for her not to have any receive any medical treatment, she would have been in pain, she would have um, you know, really, really suffered like Uncle Ronnie and then our poor auntie, because I don't even know where Wim Layton was at the time, but she ran away. Mm. And she ran away, who was there, Annie Violet? was there with um, Annie Gore, so we found another cousin. Um, and she tried to run away as well. So they were trying to come home and find their family. But also we would like Gurok commissioners to look into our grandfather's death. Um, you know, he, his babies are here in Ballarat and he was at Yam, Yambuck when they told him that they took his baby, so back to that, when he heard that they'd been stolen and taken to Haywood and they're going to court. So he ran all the way home. Yeah. And um, they were already gone. And uh, he got very, very, very sick after that and wanted his children. And we know that story that Tony, Tony Wright wrote because we never, we know our grandfather, but we have never felt his, we feel his love for his mum and his family. Mm. But is that the story about the dancing in the street? Monty's mm. last dance. Mm. Monty's very, last dance. Very, very moving story. Mm. Mm. And that comes from a non-Indigenous man that we never knew. No relation, mum Tony never knew. Mm. So that's testimony, mm. I believe. Mm. But he had no it's reason the only... to. No, oh, mm. it's, it's a record. record. Yeah. But it's, it's it must an have been an extraordinary occasion. Mm. Yeah. Because he yeah. vividly remembers it, yeah. and they were going to town. Yeah. Um, witnessed it. And we just sat there and pulled over that story and... Because we're looking at it through his eyes. We don't yeah. know this story. Mum mm. never knew this story. Mm. You know, she knew her father died of a broken heart, eh, Jo? Mm. Mm. And but for this telling fellow to come along, and we just... Uh, to, to think of my grandfather in the street, Very dancing sick. like he's absolutely lost his mind. And because is that, of his children are gone, his home's gone, he's deep, he's lost everything. And, um, and that's coming from somebody else's. It's a good thing that mum didn't know, I yeah. think, that story. Mm, that would have just I think that was, yeah. I think that was meant to come out after mum left. And you know, Tony was talking about grandfather's eyes and he describes the dance movement. So to me, I feel that's very spiritual that he, because our people are tribal people, people too, mm. that that could have been an old dance that he was doing because mm. I, I don't know, I'm, mm. I would want that that's what he was doing. But to because talk about spoke, grandfather's eyes. They spoke language, those mm. two old people sitting in the chair. Mm. Mm. They whispered yeah. it. Mm. They didn't speak it out loud, but it was mm. whispered. And one of them is his mother. Yeah. So there would have been some secret practices, mm. I believe. Somewhere. So that's where our, we lost our language, just as recent as then, yeah. so. Um, but we would want your rook to look into our grandfather's death because if the 3rd of June 1954 is the day they were taken, I think it was, we thought it was about five years later, it possibly, well, definitely on the 22nd of January 1959 that he passed away. And what I found in Mum's papers, and I try to find that document, but um, if you could, if there's any records in the coroner's court, there was an in inquest into his death. Mm. So he's gone from running back from Yambuck, going to, coming to Hayward, his children are gone, and he's devastated, and he never recovered. Mm. So he's ended up in the Q Psychiatric Hospital in Springvale. Um, Mum said she went to visit him once, and um, I don't know if he was sick or, but she, she did get to go visit him. And I think it was mum or gran who said, he realised that something was wrong because they wouldn't let him shave. He wanted to um, get ready to see the kids. They were coming to visit him. And that devastated him. But um, his records, his, the inquest is just a um, determination on, um, how he died, but there's no investigation into the circumstances, and because for him, he was just left in a he was just left in that hospital, basically to rot, and not treated like a human. We don't know what his record. We know that he 
died of malnutrition and bed sores. We know that. But after he passed away, um, I was sitting there one day with my grandmother and I don't know how this, it's a long, long time ago and um, she was going to visit him. I don't know whether he was sick or, um, but she was going to visit him um, and she got to the hospital and they said, oh, Mrs Foster, we're sorry to inform you, but your husband's passed away. Mm -hmm. And she was absolutely shocked and devastated. And she said, where is he? And I said, Mrs Foster, we're, we're sorry to tell you that we've had to bury him in a pauper's grave. Mm -hmm. That, she was devastated, she didn't speak, there was just this silence, and I'll just list, listen to her tell this story. And, um... Did they not contact her before? No. Him? She just turned up? Mm -hmm. And she'd been visit. visiting, hasn't she? She'd been she'd visiting been him, so they knew. She, she was married, that was his wife, that was mm -hmm. her husband. So... What year is that? Um, he passed away in 59. So, you know, like, so her children have been, mum's kids have been in the orphanage for five years. Her husband's obviously yep. been really heartbroken, traumatised, never recovered from his children, you know, and the fact that that happened to him. So she was, and they, she sat under the tree, so, so she just, she was floored, she collapsed. And she said, um... They said, Mrs. Foster, we're so sorry, would you like us to arrange a burial? Mm. And she, she just said, no, please, just leave him, let him rest. Mm. And um, these are the stories that we get told, you know, mm. as, as we're adults. And mm. I don't know why, but to hear my grandmother speak and tell that story was just... So we would like the York to investigate the circumstances on how, because it's also after he passed away too, if we Yurok can investigate that as well, because he wasn't, you know, grandfather was what they did to his body after he passed Our away. father was, who worked for the funeral service. Was an undertaker. Was an undertaker. Glenn Peters, yeah, mm -hmm. so the Victorian Aboriginal yeah. funeral years. service, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, he always, you know, he done all the funerals. He yeah. done everyone's very, that many people, but it was his mission. I got to mention Dad, mm -hmm. Jimmy Wright. Um, he knew that Mum's father was buried in Pauper's grave, mm -hmm. so he took Mum and Dad took out a two thousand dollar bank loan, and mm -hmm. they never had much back then. Um, and repatriated him mm. back here, yeah. and that dad had to, to dig him up and um, do all the arrangements. So he actually dug him up, and he well, was in a little box. Motion. So this is a six foot man, mm -hmm. and so he, he once he removed him from the box, he was he was sawed, chopped up, mutilated, mutilated mm -hmm. before being buried in yes, Pauper's grave. Yes, grave. Yeah. yeah. So I just think total we, we, devastation of, of him and then he's gone with no family with so him. No and kids. then no kids. They've seen your And present. so then why was he why why was that done to him? Why was he that's suspicious? Because what are you trying to hide? What are you trying to cover up there? And that's why you rook can look into that because there's an inquest report. Um, he didn't because how long has he left there? You know, we don't know, but... Malnutrition, one, and bed sores, like... Neglect. Um, <laughs> total neglect. Now you can see he's laying in a room, probably... How much trauma do you inflict on one human? But also, really, he, he's... Even in death, hmm. they cut him up. But he was a fit, healthy man, wasn't he? he was yeah, chopped wood, split wood, top. worked. Yeah. And, um, he... But he was grieving. <laughs> Because for him, for grandfather, his grand was terminally ill with TB. So she was, the hospital said, you've got one month to live. So TB was right on our, all, all generations of our family. So we used to get x-rays in COVID when we were kids to make sure we didn't have TB. Mm. But, um, so he was grieving for his children. He was a parent who, who did not survive his children being taken from him. So that was what caused um, him to become unwell, the system. 
um, and in a system that cares for people who are unwell. Um, that's how they treated him. And he do, he, we need to honour his memory and um, bring to light what happened to him for his justice and for Graham. Um, she was devastated to find out about him. Um, so we don't know how long, you know, and then, um, and he's gone. And we just thrown him over there and this is what's happened to him. And with the um, repatriation here at the mission, because we'll go there. And we had a beautiful funeral. Mm -hmm. So, Gran was there. Mm -hmm. She passed away how far? How yeah. Joe? We buried... September or January, the same day as so he passed away. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they got the same death date, the 22nd January. So she sort of waited for him to come home. Mm -hmm. And then she... She went. Mm -hmm. She went, On the exact yeah. same day. As he passed date, away. So. Mm -hmm. But there's, what, 30 years or something? 33 oh, years, yeah. 33 years between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she went home yep. on the same day, which... Unless you look, you know, sometimes people look and that's it. The dates are mm. amazing. And Tony, you said about Dad, you know, when we spoke about Mum and Dad meeting in Fitzroy and Dad come, Dad's Camilla Roy come down from Newcastle and was doing mm. some work on the wharves and met this young girl who'd just come out of the Ballarat Orphanage and fell madly in love and lived there happily ever after and had mm. their, their four kids. But we... They both were hard workers and we moved, to what, moved around, so as much as we lived in Collingwood, Mum and Dad had me in Newcastle, teen, 11 months older, later Tina in um, Sydney. Um, but then we've got video footage of us here in Haywood at, with Aunty Emma mm. and family, and we know that um, and Tina's 12 months old, and we can tell by this video that Mum is pregnant with our brother. And he was born, so three three years in a row, the three kids, so these two, Sydney. Mm. And, um, yeah, so we back and forth between New South and, and Vic. So they were moving us around. But he, Dad was following work, and we were always with our family. We talked about that last night, how we were with Mum and Gran and Uncle Ronnie mm. and Auntie Gloria. We, we grew up with them. But... Um, I forget what I was saying, sis. Can you tell me? Don't forget, Joanne was born there. <laughs> yeah, I was just getting into thank you. <laughs> and then mum and dad <laughs> had a little bit of a break up for us, and yeah. then baby girl mm -hmm. um, was born in 72 at Bournemouth. We were living on Fram Mission. Fram then. Mission. Dad was doing a bit of work there, and we were living with Uncle Banjo and Uncle Banjo, Uncle Banjo Clark and Uncle Percy there for a while, mm -hmm. and Aunty Gloria, and that was there too. Mm -hmm. We need to talk there. about their trauma, the old people. Yeah. Uncle Laura and Uncle Ronnie, mm. Aunty Letty, and their children, mm. and how they, well, after all their trauma, they um, picked up the bottle. Mm. So they self medicated, yeah. um, which I feel would have only been, there was no, no support services back in them days mm. for anyone. You know, you've mm. been ripped from your home, torn apart from your family. Mm. You end up in Fitzroy with all your mob and in the park. a lot of them picked up the bottle to help deal with that. Um, our aunties lost their kids. Mm. They, not to the system, but to men. Mm. But the fathers. Probably weren't very nice people. Mm. But, um, Especially Aunty Glaw because... Aunty Glaw and Aunty Letty. Um, mm. She had three children. Aunty Glaw had three, four, five, 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 three boys and two girls. And I have their names up there because mm. the three of them suicided mm. due to the um, being take being living away from their mum. So mm. Aunty Gloria's boys, um, Ed, Eddie, and Derek, never reco they were never recovered from mm. moving to WA mm. or with their father, but not seeing their mother, and they wanted to. And her eldest son, Wayne, he was 17. He, his father kept him away from his mum, from Aunty Gloria, so 
he he knew that she was in Fitzroy. He wanted to meet her. He wanted his mum, and they wouldn't let him. So he was seventeen when he suicided. Mm -hmm. And then Derry and Ed, <coughs> after they'd been living with their father, and they come back because they were only little fellas. I don't even know. They would have been six, eight, just. And they come back as seven, 16, 17 year olds and found um, Auntie Gloria and they were living together. But um, Derek, Derek was, um, had epilepsy. He was actually on the front page of the Herald Sun one year for the Royal Children's Hospital appeal. Yeah. And, um, and we grew up with them because we were living in Sylvan by then and um, it was doing a bit of picking. Yeah. And um, he suicided. But then her. Her other son, um, his brother, Eddie, he was 30 and he suicided. And he was living in WAA Joe. Mm. Trying to get home for the mother. But just, and how does how do you explain away as, as a mother what, mm. you know, has, but making the best decision for her children was to let them, the system that's gone, their parent. Who's going to support her? Mm. So she dealt help? with that, yeah. They, they didn't have, you know, um, yeah, it's, can it's, we also I think can we find we want to find to make sure this story um, is told we need to find Gran's letters because she had to keep writing is it to the protection board or is it to the orphanage to get her children back so she's there she's working she's she wants her children back um, so there's records of that so you know, Can I just ask a question about the records? Is it really you've obviously gone and searched, and what what is you just can't get them or you can't find? Like, what's the what's stopping? Well, we're just we're, so when we're we're just learning about the details mm -hmm. of what happened. So there's lots of different okay. yep. things going on. But if if, if mum was sick or anything happened, why aren't those medical records in her mm -hmm. her file department file? And that department file's not all there. Is, have you got these records, what, the ones that you've accessed, have they, they come through pop prof? No, these ones are from the department. Mum applied for her file under the Freedom mm -hmm. of Information mm -hmm. Act and, right. and she's got the file and the letters um, for that. So that's what you did back in the day. Mm -hmm. This is pre anything around redress, it was none of that. Yep. Mum just wanted her records. Not so it's got her wages. Yeah, it could be. Who knows where all that information is. but. You know, you're talking about an orphanage that was using children. Mm -hmm. The orphanage, lay, the higher, orphanage but also I think's worth pursuing because the state mm -hmm. controlled their, you know, they said you can have your children or not have your children. Mm -hmm. Because how much money has have those kids made for mm -hmm. whoever the farmers, whatever, mm -hmm. who knows, but um, um, I was gonna I was gonna ask if you wanna talk to the commissioners about the wages issue or Mm. I think your uncle Ronnie would have, you know, I think you said that he would have made wages on the farm and mm. how that was treated, what you know about how that money was treated, where that money went. They took administration, they took a percentage, they took, so they get their little whatever pound, I don't know, pound, pence, thruppence, but um, you can see it on the ledger. I just hate the handwriting in the ledger. It's just so authoritarian. It's just really disgusting, but... It says all the wages that she earned, and then there's this part taken out. So that must have went. Not only are they working for the orphanage, mm -hmm. um, they're giving back mm -hmm. to the orphanage, it, whether they're working in the laundry or on the farm. So it's a, absolutely, you know. And she, when disgusting. she left the orphanage, she was sent off with was it seventeen pounds? Yeah, I can't remember. Was a so we don't need accumulation. Yeah, after all yeah. The years of work. yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's... And they wanted to. She wanted a job in the shop, and they, and just what they said about mum and her records that you know, no, just keep her in the laundry. Mm. <clears throat> so she probably had aspirations, you know, as a little girl, mm. and wanted to do things herself. But you know, we don't even for our cousins, you know, they don't even know. We want this re public record to be for them, mm. because we got to stay with our parents. Um, not all of our um, cousins did, but they need to understand what happened to their mother, um, their mothers, um, and back to once um, they were six, 17 and they um, left uh, Ballarat Orphanage, I think it was through Royal Park, and that's how 
they found their way to Fitzroy and into the park, and that's mm -hmm. where they reconnected with all the other kids. We were told their mother was passed away, that was Uncle Wardy. He was told his mum, that's our grandfather's um, sister. Um, Uncle Lordy's mum had passed away, so he thought he had no mum. And then all the other cousins and in that park, and that's how um, they would connect with those families and then find out where their parents were. But this land had already been taken, so you see all the, I'm not even saying, talking about them for all the good things. Um, but you know, they lived in Collingwood um, and tried to recover from whatever happened to them in that institution. We don't know how brutal they were, we can just only imagine. Um, we we'll talk about the ages that we lost them because we did grow up with those Darwins. Yeah. And even though they had their demons, we loved them. We slept mm. with them, mm. ate with them, lived with them. Mm. I mean, cried for them. Yeah. Mm. Auntie Letty, we used to love going to her house. Look, when beautiful we, aunties. We, they used to, uh, Tina and I went over to Sylvan, our auntie Letty. She, um, she was so beautiful. She's very talented. Um, she used to play the accordion. Uh, we still got one of her accordions at Mum's. Our Uncle Ronnie was a parky in Fitzroy. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we all worked at the health service and he'd come over and said, can you lend me five dollars for a bit of feed? And we knew <laughs> that it wasn't. And um, we didn't okay, care. We'd, but we didn't judge them. We, we loved were them. walking across the road and I said, I'll take you over and get your bowl of soup. <laughs> and he, mm. then he'd have to admit he wants five dollars for a card. Mm. So, but they were beautiful, 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 loving. Like, mm. you wouldn't, you know, they just were. They were quiet too because they never told that this was all, they all kept that inside. Mm. So Uncle Ronnie would go wandering. He used to hitchhike over to WA mm. and hitchhike back and walk over there. Joan was very close with Barney Bully. Mm. Yeah. They had a very close relationship. Yeah. Mm. You know, Jo, and that was there when she passed away. Yeah. Died on her doorstep. She but she won that slot ho. <laughs> First division. First division. Really? She was she in the did. park then. She was homeless. Yeah, she was homeless. Yeah, and she was drinking in the park. And next yeah. minute she won Tut Slotto. She put on the biggest barbecue for all the bar for the parkies and bought flags. <laughs> <laughs> I said to her one day, why don't you go get a hire a limousine and go for it? She just bust out laughing at me. You and, know, she, like, and she bought a house two doors down from Mum. Mm. So then they were close. Mm. And Joan was just there mm. all the time. Mm. So... She was only 50 when she passed away. She was 50. Mm. Uncle Ronnie was, Uncle Ronnie was 37. 37. Auntie, uh, Auntie Letty was... 40. You were saying maybe 42, early 40s. Mm. So, Too young. So Mum had to bury her brothers she, and sisters. Too young. Yeah, yeah, too young. Her mother, she had to... Bury. Um, we had to bury Gran. She's buried here. And that really devastated her that day. Mm. Um, also, then she buried Dad. So Dad and Mum come home, 96 age over, with a little couple of acres to live in their best life and retired and kept chooks and everything. And then he passed away in 98. Mm. And then 22 years later, Mum was gone. So we had a, we were lucky to have yeah, all that, that time, time with Mum, yeah. mm. but we had to let her go because she needed to be with Dad. She'd been away from him. And that's the only thing that's given me comfort is to know that she's with dad and she, not only dad i was saying to the to the family that she's with her parents and she's back with her siblings but she's still here with us mm. um there will be there is um a brony like nobody had money mm. auntie Gloria, mm. auntie Letty, mm. they're all buried in the one grave, grave in um faulkner. faulkner so one of mum's Thing was she wanted them repatriated. Mm. Um, Dad made the headstones. When you go down to the cemetery here, mm. Dad made the headstones, just out of concrete, and got plugs, little plastic plugs made. They just did the best that they could. Mm. Um, because we never prospered. Mm. As, you know, we, we, were, we struggled age mm. But we always had food on the table. Yeah. But mum, before mum went, she was saying, she was looking into, because she was on the fight, she was mm. fighting 
mm. this system. Um, I've given Emily letters to Gavin Jennings, to Gabrielle. Mm. Mum yeah. had a fall at Christmas time. And I wrote to Gavin and said, Gavin, Mum's extremely, she, she never got out of bed after that. Mm. Um, she, just before Christmas, she fell out of bed. And sometimes, elders, she was walking and everything before that. Mm. But sometimes when their old elders fall, they don't, they lose all confidence. Yep. They don't know why, but mm. it happens. And so we was concerned about her health. And I wrote to Gavin about redress, the scheme, what's happening constantly. You know, year after year, I'd be, she'd be meeting with them. But um, he wrote straight back to me. I said, Mum's had a fall. And he said, he's going to make this like he's a priority this year. I've got a photo of Eunice at my desk. He has. Um, redress his, his priority this year. So Mum passed after I sent that letter in February, she passed in March. Mm. So that wasn't quick enough for her. So the Victorian government had all those consultations over for a period of time and, mm. and nothing. And, and, and she was on oxygen, she was gravely ill. Like, mm. what the, mm. Why? Um, uh, under which scheme was he talking about? Is this from bringing them home? Was it something else or not? Well, mention, funny you mention that, Annie Eleanor, because in that report, and I don't know, you tell me, but I think under section 14, 16, 80, it's got the, um, it's got the, um, it sets out all the, um, oh, what's the oh, word? I usually know this off the top of my head, but all the heads of damage for a compensation claim. Right. So deprivation of liberty yeah. in the bringing them home report. Right. So that's been sitting there since 1997. Mm -hmm. But Victoria, apart from the other states, done nothing. Mm. And here's mum in her 80s after everything, mm. trying to um, have a, a normal life and raise her kids, try and get go to the vows to do a story. And it's been sitting there the whole time. Mm -hmm. So the government of Victoria, you. Well, across the Commonwealth, new here's, here's, here's a national report, but um, here in Victoria, not only did they do nothing, they didn't care, mm -hmm. and they and they weren't a shut. They mm -hmm. there was no. It was that that was just ignored. But there was an announcement last year, and I don't know, so any of you are closer to this, about an amount of money for yeah. a certain a number of people, but who was on all days. Oh, yeah, that, I see. So, yes. I, see what, no, I see what you're saying. There's no yes. uh, in a certain amount of time mm. of death or, mm. or anything like that. Mm. We were so, mm. there's no. There's Mum's no, death brought no about the announcement. Mm. 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 When Mum right. died, because she worked right. so balanced and wasn't. hard and yes. sat with Clint, um, Gavin, mm. when she died, I see. he just could see the injustice. You can't, you've, got to, you've got to see the injustice of that. But I, I don't think that. Announcement uh, covered all of the people that uh, was intended. I think that it's a, a a number that's finite that does not include everybody. I think that yeah, mum, we, we can't apply on mum's behalf because she's passed away, and that's clear in the which yeah, is right. a dead set kick in the guts. Well, and you it, wait long enough, everybody passes away. Exactly, well, they that's waited. my point. Mm. They waited, and you tell me no. the trauma of my mother's wife. He doesn't deserve justice. He does nothing. Mm. Too bad, too sad. Four days. Mm. Four days before, after she died, Gavin Jennings ran us here on this property mm. to tell us within 24 hours. Mm. How long does it take to get... Um, like, you would have to know. Like, it doesn't take four days to get to announce redress. I mm. would believe that it was already ready to be announced mm. way before Mum died, probably a year before Mum died. We're dealing with the, the system. Sexual. We're dealing with a system, a big system. There's so much system. But it took four system. days that this announcement no, could no, come no, out after no, Mum no. died. And no. just, the, it didn't Bureaucracy is a great big silo. Yeah, it's, oh, well, it was it's absolute, absolutely sometimes. An absolutely injustice mm. to my mother was the last mm. kick that's in the guts bad, that this government had system. to her. See, that's what, see, you deflect attention away from the real issue is the way that this, um, you know, we bought the brunt of colonisation and those, the massacre sites are all across Victoria. Mm. So I think of all my grandparents not and great-grandparents from what they went through. 
in terms of terror, the reign of terror. Yeah. And we're talking, we were just talking in the car about the massacres down here, and we were just talking about how, how, dis, how the settlers would use the skulls of our women um, as shaving cups, and they would put mm -hmm. them on their huts. So this is our country here, um, but back to the government who needs to be held accountable. You had all that information there. You had a national inquiry. So the racist politicians, because it is racism, it's strategic racism, it's systemic racism. Yeah. If they're going to use bureaucracy as the excuse to say, hang on, how many fellas all got masters degrees? Aren't you all friggin' lawyers and um, you're sort of setting yourselves up for your million dollar super and all, everything mm -hmm. else, but you can't make a decision all your procedures for black kids are there and we removed them, but here in terms of make writing a wrong and doing um, because I, I, our, our humanity, our people's humanity um, has been attacked. We are a beautiful, beautiful people. We have such amazing superior knowledge. This country was beautiful and we raised generations of kids. Um, with beautiful stories. We, we know about all the stuff about, you know, the first astronomers, scientists, I'm not... But here's a system who has... Um, hasn't treated us humanely, and we're talking about the government. You, you, had that, you had the evidence there from the Bringing Home Report, you did nothing. Mm. And Mum had to... Here we have dying elders um, rallying and lobbying um, with the support of Lydia Thorpe, it was very, very supportive of mum and the elders. They were getting in their little buses, bars, buses, and getting their little placards done and everything, and that was proud. And mum was, was proud. the apology was the other day. Mm -hmm. You just started boycotting them, doing silent vigils, mm -hmm. sitting outside of the cup of teas, and mm -hmm. she just said, the two, all this money's being <laughs> poured into, into cup of teas all over Australia. Mm -hmm. Like, stop having cup of teas and listen mm -hmm. to me. But Tina, our, our people have got, got to get smarter in negotiations with government. Uh, I mean, this whole thing that's, that's right. going on about closing the gap. Somebody's got to say to government when they're sitting down about a program, what are you going to recognise from my people, this individual, this organisation, that we have brought into your lives and in which you've t stolen parts of our language to you talk about places using our... Mm. Pe our people yes, have got to get yeah. smarter on that. Yeah. And that's... that's but you know what it is? It, it can't be separate. It mm. cannot be separate. Mm. Because it's, we're always on the deficit side. Yes. There's, no, there's no idea that we're sharing. No idea. We're robbed every day. Yeah. So we've got to get smart about talking. Uh, yeah. you know, and the, and the, the sovereignty talk... That, un that can underpin sovereignty Absolutely. by behaving in that way because we just keep giving and giving mm -hmm. time and some people do very well out of it mm. uh, and yeah. nothing changes. No, true, uh, We've got to make a stand that is, to me, radical in, 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 in dealing with the bureaucracy because absolutely. they make the rules and we just get, turn up every year. Yeah, exactly. And that's not going to change if we don't change. So how do you expose the truth and the failures of the government? Um, how does your rook expose that? Because we're in a bit of a predicament here, aren't we? Because mm -hmm. even the instrument that um, initiates um, mm -hmm. this process comes from yep. over there. Well, this is our reality, so that's, that's exactly. what I'm saying. Mm. We've got to speak to that reality, mm. not speak as though, oh, we're still down here. Mm. And they're up there. We've got to speak to that yeah. and say, not just say on oh, truth or treaty, we've got to say this That's right, in day-to-day -day dealings. Mm. Every time that mm. you're in meetings, you've got to bring to the table. You've got to bring that story of injustice yes, in, yes. and fight and remind... Because we give it away all the time. Yeah. just giving and giving and it's... Mum gave yeah. it all her life. Mm. Well, yeah, and she and did. No one, the no, one gave, no one gave a shit. And no this, one what's the point? cared. What's mm -hmm. the point? She just was screaming it from the rooftop. She was yelling it without no breath. She had no lungs. Mm. But Tired see, the report. No one gave a shit. No, no they did it. No, still don't. They don't care. Yep. There was talks with Gavin Jennings. We sat down at the Whittlesea Council. Yeah. And she's asking again, sick. Um, 
He said, Eunice, you know, there's $600 million sitting in the um, mm. redress for sexual abuse, because that came out mm. first, before. Mm. And that was for all mm. non-Indigenous and... He said, they're not going to use all that money. So... But what are you telling us? We can put, mm. you know, 400... Promises, promises. 500 million into... Because he's doing you a favour. But she's t he's pissing in her pocket. Yes, actually, he, is. He's in her pocket. he had he's pissed in her pocket. Mm. Like we've got you've got six hundred million sitting there now. Okay, fix. I wanted it fixed tomorrow. Mm. But see, that's the power. That's the that power. That was just to shut her up. He has the power Someone there, up. and he's so privileged that he can sit there and tell you about mum and that there's all this money, but come how many months later when she's nearly passing away and he's done nothing. He needs to be held accountable. We was, we was devastated by the announcement. Yeah. Mum fought for out. herself and all the stolen generation and I found it really hard to be happy for everybody. And mm. what uh, that doesn't sit well with me is that when the First People's Assembly did not um, help us get redress, our, our mother and our elders yeah, the did. That's the their fault. That so okay, this appropriation the of that story yeah. by an institution that I'm a part of, and I don't, yes. I don't care. I'm here with you, Rook. I can speak my truth, and I don't care. But you, it, that that community, the community initiated this process. Mm -hmm. Doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. We even we've got to be careful. Of our organisations need to be held accountable yeah. because do not go on a marketing spree and then talk up an institution um, and the leaders there who have no lived, um, lived experience are proud, are proud to say, oh, oh yeah, but don't use our old people, our parents, our mother, to um, justify the existence of something that comes from grassroots. Do not, do not desecrate or disrespect them um, because it was mum and the elders who who got redress because the government had a report from 97. So First Purpose Assembly didn't do that. So And that's I just want that on the record. Well it's in and the that's, individuals and, uh, that's, all the time, that's Donna, the, like you said. That's putting like the co-chairs on notice. Mm. So I can say that here. But we know that, that's the story, isn't it? Mm. That's you know the people that went before, that's why we honour them because those they voices went before. before. And we all and know whole that families have fought. Yeah. And then we might sit here as commissioners mm. as you will, but it's your voices that we want to elevate, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't, it's not just because we're a Royal Commission, it's that fight you fought and those before you. And you know won. what? It we've got, got to, to go beyond the voice, so we've got yeah. to have some action. That yeah. Is, oh, not well, that that's voice. what I'm saying. Not that voice, but the voice of that's our That's what voice. I want to say. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. I want to go there with you, Eleanor, <laughs> because as commissioners, like, I know he's mm. all. Look, we've got black fellows here sitting on the team, probably can relate to him us and feel our pain mm -hmm. mm. um giving our evidence today um do you feel that mum has been denied justice well, honestly I, I, well she certainly was in <laughs> she had no rights in her early life there yeah. was none at all mm. and she was set on a pathway that how she became a wonderful person that she became, I mean, mm. beggars belief, yeah. you know, really, when you think about it, all of the things that were done and said and the behaviours. Mm. Uh, so I can't say that she, I don't know how she felt about how she went about what she was doing, but obviously mm. she wanted to make change. Mm. That's the big mm. thing. She did really want to change things. Yeah. Can I add to that? Because I, I, I think I want to say that at, at the most basic level, injustice um, is racial discrimination, and your mother was subject to racial discrimination from the moment she was born until the mm. moment she died. Mm. Yeah. So, in my own mind, the the answer is most definitely yes. Mm. She was subject to injustice, and we're here to expose that. Yes. Yeah. And you're helping us to do exactly that. Yeah. And you know what else it is too, because we talk about stolen yeah. generations, mm. oh. and this is what what people are. I get a sense that sometimes, depending on where you are, people are tired of it. Mm. And I'm thinking that that 
um, mm. worries me mm. because mm. you don't know the truth. Mm. And this is about mums and our grandparents and our family's truth that needs to go on public record. But we've got unfinished business that we need investigations into what happened to our grandfather mm. and the mistreatment of our um, mum mm. and family. As, on, as public record, but this mum wanted to provide education too. She, we worked at Yapra for years and looked after babies. We, we love doing that. Um, but this is a, this is for all the other, uh, across the community to understand what happened in our country to our family. We don't speak for anybody else and what happened, but it's part of our history. It's part of our identity. But it's important, you know. We have to tell the truth. No um, sugar coating. Yeah. None of this, because if you look at the ages, how beautiful and healthy our family was, and mm -hmm. from 1954 onwards, in that short period of time, and because we've got, we want these beautiful photos of our families, and then come the end of that with Uncle Ronnie and Auntie Gloria and um, Auntie Letty, they were just absolutely I don't, I, I, heartbroken and devastated. So and that's they, our truth. And they, they how do we get our justice? Mm. 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 Well, there's lots to, to look at mm. in this just on its own. It's different. Mm. I mean, you can't mm. tell truth and just tell truth, right? You need justice. Yes. Mm. I'm just not sitting here. Mm. No, like I Mum agree, did year that's... after year, year after yes. year, year after mm. year, mm. till I'm a really old lady. Mm. Um, because we're our, her voices now. Yeah. And nobody listened to her. They gamingly did, but mm. look, tra tragically, this is the story of many families. How many times have we heard? Mm. People that have come before us that they can speak easily three generations, if not four, mm. easily yeah. in yeah. terms of the continuity. So it's mm. no secret. So how how we manage this and how we do some oh, so you got a, a crazy mm. thought sitting here is you know how we, we do genealogy. I was thinking mm. of all the things that happen to individuals in your family. If you did mm. a genealogy with no names, mm. but what happened to these individuals? Yes. The, the, the kind of breaches of human rights, human rights and just basic, basic mm. is, 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 would be horrific. Mm. Much more so than human look, rights, because they had their identity stolen. So well, it was then, about absolutely. denial of a well, people. That is your basic, most but, but basic thing. It, it, it was denial of the individual rights, but there was a collective denial, the denial of, of who they were as people mm. and who they were to this land. Yes. Mm. And mm. that's outside the scope of well, human it's us. rights. It's oh, us. Okay. It's not them, it's us. Mm. You know, it's us. I think that well, there is cause for argument about whether human rights embraces what mm. uh, Commissioner Walter just said. Uh, but I absolutely agree that the denial was that fundamental. Mm. Well, it was done. It was done based on race. I mean, there's no question about exactly. it. Exactly. Mm. All of the legislation's got the names in it. You know, the Aboriginal or whatever, mm. and it caused this. You know, mm. these systems to be created so and these treatments. What would justice? Do you have any idea to what would look, justice look like to you? Mum never said. She was never really about the money. Mm. It would have helped her. Um, how do you how do you how do you give her justice after everything we've just told her? What is it? So how, is there ways that because we want to celebrate and honour our family and share that amazing story of their resilience and courage and strength, mm -hmm. regardless. Yeah. But also, is this report going on an international level? Oh or yeah. Is you were going to report to the UN or or something to? Is that the, I don't know, does that get, um, how does that... Well, we... we, we I know it's, it's for we the We don't report to the UN. We, we no, report no, no, to no, the I First know. Peoples and, and, to, and to the Governor. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we are linked with international processes and, the, and there are um, UN committees and, and yep. uh, special rapporteurs and I'm not sure if you know about these, you know, the, uh, the way that UN rights are enforced, but there have been reports written which have acknowledged our work. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are very much connected exactly. uh, with, uh, with, with UN human rights processes. Uh, and the, um, there is an international organisation uh, that promotes uh, justice uh, for First Peoples uh, through truth-telling and other mechanisms. Uh, and that organisation helped in the establishment of Europe and was represented on the committee for the appointment of all the commissioners you see here. 
So the answer is yes. So how is it all, the, the, all the people who... At a convenient time for a break, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council. The international spotlight, because you, you wouldn't want a watered down version mm -hmm. of, of what's happening here. Yeah. Because without the UN, we wouldn't have the right to be self-determining without that declaration. Mm -hmm. So that's got us to where we are today, our self-determination. But I suppose exposing all the ugliness. I think it's, for me, mm. it's part of, it's so ingrained this system, this systemic injustice, and you've just explained like levels mm. of it in different mm. areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's how we, these systems, need to either be abolished or changed. Yeah. How do we do that here so it doesn't happen again? Right? That would be the first thing for me. These systems cannot continue the harm, which they still continue today, and which we hear constantly every day on our people. Yeah. So our our main objective is a systemic injustice. Mm. Now there is a, a of course there's an element of human rights in there, but is that going to change the system? We need these systems rebuilt. Like yes, you can't yeah. tinker around these edges and, and what have you. And, and I really want you to think about, you know, what is what does that that's a really good mm. question. What does what would justice look like, you think? Or your mum. I mean, you can come back at any time with with, mm -hmm. with a response. Like you, well, she's lost her home. Mm. Yeah, she's lost anything that she could have privileged us with growing up. Yes, because you lost it as well. Mm. We yeah. did. You We've lost, lost it. everything. She lost it. That, yeah. that, yeah. that you know, mm. we had. It was hard. Living, we had to live in Melbourne. We were brought up and born in Sydney and travelled mm. around and lived in Melbourne, and it was really hard to come back on country because, you know, we weren't brought up here. Even though well, this is our mob, you can, there's a, there's a certain feeling with mob that live on country and the ones that live off country. A, that's, the, that's the hangover of colonisation as that's well. That's it, it's we not us. we you all and remove you and take you, right? So you're left feeling like, it's like that in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. This work as well. How we do you were compensate connected. for that? Or yeah. How do you get justice for yes. that? Mm. The problem with the system is everything takes so long to change. It's just you know, just it's cut it off your legs. But uh, uh, the the one thing that you know we have to grapple with is how we can make recommendations that do trigger change. Uh, because we can't we can't put out a report and in thirty years time no. we're going to say oh that was you saying you know are we are we going to be part of that or not. We have to be able to give some kind of mechanism or some um, create some uh, awareness about how to trigger change with mm. the system. We've just got to do that and we need willing people, but we've got to have behaviours changed too by individuals because mm. keep on saying the same thing. Exactly. Mm. And our, our sovereignty is the key to our longevity mm. and a better future. Yeah. because of our very sovereignty that's been taken away. And we have, uh, we have structures and legal systems from a sovereign that lives in another country. Yeah. So what they're actually doing is they've just come and extended, um, um, use this land here to create wealth and it all keeps the crown rich, mm. doesn't it? But there's the first law of the country and it's our sovereignty and the, so the more that we have systems that support us, mm not deny us or exclude us because that gets us into trouble because we've had young kids who have asserted their so sovereignty in a legal setting and have been locked up mm. yeah. um, and these are kids I used to look after. But that's a very threatening thing to assert your sovereignty. Exactly in a legal so mm. for us we'd be damned if we do and damned if we don't. We, do we really have any rights at the end of the day and what will um, mm. you rook? How you know we spoke about going to the guts of it. Recognise our um, sovereignty and our humanity mm. and that this process should expose all the this is all the evidence there's no denying it and it's indigenous right. right but we've got to for, for our kids future we've got to give back to them what was taken from them mm. and we've got to acknowledge this so the only thing that we have left is this morning we had a welcome today I spoke to auntie Eleanor and spoke to Maggie and yourself Kevin mm. Um, Tim and everyone else and Tara and, mm. and 
um, all the different mobs here because that's our law and our practice. And mm. if that's a very, very, the last parts of it, we've got to, then we'll get the language and the rest of it. But that's our subject because what happens is now lots of other systems such as native title is determining us. We're now quite comfortable using white fellas' language to describe mm. people. But I would rather know maybe Palawa mob. I know I'll go and tell everyone I met Maggie's Palawa mob, but I want to have a yarn with Maggie because mm. I want to know her family and the, the Briggs story and how it originated there. And I've known only Eleanor and Sue Ann um, because that's a, that's a very basis of mm. how we operate. Mm. It's the very thing that's kept us strong. And it's the mm. thing that survived colonisation. Mm. But if we... If we're going to go and toe the line of assimilation to fit a yarn that makes the government of the day look good, oh yes, we just have put up your rock and there's a report and mm -hmm. bad luck. That's not going to help us. We I want mean, that's not what we're here for. <coughs> exactly. So I don't want to talk about be a bureaucrat or anything because it's obviously <laughs> the system. But um, it's the only time I get to talk and be with my sisters and my family. How do you feel about justice for Mum Jo? What? What do you mm. think her justice should be? And and grand grandfather. Mm. You know, it's a whole mm. family, isn't it? Mm. It's, yeah. not, you know, it's not just mum. Mm. Yeah. She's this is her, her aunties mm. and her, her her children. Her sisters and her brother. Mm. I think justice for grandfather would be to expose what happened to him. Yeah. Because he died without dignity. Mm. He was treated inhumanely. <coughs> and we need to um, fix that. Mm. And, and for Gran as well, she well, had her kids stolen, taken, like, yeah. as a mother. If you look at our yeah. grandkids, yeah. Mm. if anyone would come to take them, you know, yeah. mm. just like that, gone. They want yeah. that minute and gone. And yeah. just telling the story is powerful, but it, mm. it risks becoming just voyeurism unless there's some justice attached mm. to it. Exactly. Mm. We, mm. Mum wanted justice. So I don't know how you look at that and how I can mm. say, answer your question. Mm. In 2008, <coughs> on the 14th of February, we went up for the apology blew yeah. up as a Victorian rep. <coughs> and Mum was real, you know, she's had to protect herself, like not even trust white people or anything. But when we got on that plane and this there was a bit of a there was a from the airport there she was really happy to be doing this. Mm. But um this fella said to Mum who's sitting on the plane and he said, um, Oh, are you going up for the apology? And I thought, oh, I'm just gonna let her own this moment. Mm. She goes, Yes I am and he's and this conversation happened. That's really huge for Mum mm -hmm. to have talk to a stranger and have that yarn, but for her. And, you know, we had this apology and it gave, it shone a light on and validated our truth. <coughs> but actually, we're just having little events mm. and little running cup sheets. Of let's, let's cup of tea. Let's take a box. Let's have a welcome. Yeah. And it's not, no Could disrespect. It's no disrespect. Can you give me a, a total... But what How you much said they're spending on cup of teas every year at the apology. <laughs> no, yeah. I love that. Can anybody tell me? Please congratulate yeah, that themselves. will stay with me, and your mum's words will stay with me, right? Yeah. You know, everybody's having a cup of tea, and it's mm. what does it? Mm. What are you doing? What are we doing here? Yeah. Mm. Okay, We're all sitting away. and remembering the pain, so but there's, there's a there's there's something that we can take that next step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But until but we take we... the next step to address mm. the injustice, we're not going to get the justice. Mm. But we've got to take back what's ours and be able to, in our country, be true to ourselves and our people because we owe it to our children, to our sovereignty, um, is everything and the basis for our existence and our future. But, um, but if our grandfather's justice is to um, expose the truth about what happened to him, yep. and we can, you know, and honour our grandmother because this beautiful woman is an amazing woman who raised her children. She was an amazing mm. horsewoman. She walked a hay for them back. Yeah, you know? to feed her kids. Mm. Kids went to school. They yeah. were fed. Mm. They were clothed. They had, yeah, you know. yeah. And that was no easy task. No, no going into Haywood and our old... Our, how old was our old granny when she was walking into Haywood? Um, in her 80s. And she'd mm. walk home with a gunny sack on her back. Mm. They would all walk in, the kids. And yeah, the it's old, a fair drive. Old, it's like, Mm. When you go with the yeah. I couldn't. Well, they go by right horse and cart, but she walked. Right? Mm. She was, well, she would have been 30s by the time she had her kids. But she's, mm. you know, she's having babies in between. She's still mm. going in town, walking back. There's a lot of walking, I think. Yeah. yeah we got days. Honey Annie Jones walked everywhere. She never drove. Mm. And, um, mm. but yeah, the justice for our family. <clears throat> we'll just wait for it. 
Mm. And what mm. our lives would have been like if they lived on country, we would, you know. Yeah. yeah. We would have been... We've missed out on so much. Mm. We mm. would have been prospering down here now. Mm. Mm. Maybe. But in a different way. Mm. Not because we want material things, yeah. mm. but we need Rich. to be with our family on our country because we can't tell them the stories of, we know where, well, the, yeah, there's scar trees now, but some white systems are managing that and has control over that. Yeah. So all the cultural appropriation mm. that's happening at a state level and national mm. level with mm. native title, we've got to protect. Mm. Um, we spoke about data sovereignty, didn't we? Mm. You know, our stories. We can't just keep telling our stories so that someone can then just grab it and I say... I just hope it's the last time we ever say tell yeah, my stop story. Stop the circus. Can, can, can it please story? stop? That's mm. the thing. If nobody mm. else can we see, should have any right stop to touch it. Reliving this. Mm. And we could we please stop our our kids, our grandkids have a right. Um, we don't want to hurt them. Mm. And they have a right. And they do, they but Joe, little Millie, when we come down for Christmas time, we're at the cemetery seeing mum. And how old's Millie? Seven. Yeah. And they know the story. And just like, sob. The, the, the baby's are down. sobbing. Seven year old. Our yeah. babies are sobbing at mum's grave. Because yeah. they were so close. Look at them. Look at them up there. Mm. And we didn't have we did have a family photo yeah, we meant to bring us, a about one. forty of us are yeah. standing behind that old lady. But I do have to say when mum three years before we lost mum, she got very sick. We were she was gonna die. She was just losing blood from every orifice. Mm. So she was under palliative care. And so they didn't want to let her get out of hospital. I said, please, can we just take her out the mish? Mm. You know, just for a duck. One day they gave us. Mm. So she was out here in that cabin, was her cabin, this wheelchair one. And she me and her were laying there. She's, she was yelling out to her, out, out her ancestors and her elders and telling them to help her. And um, we didn't think we, we, she was going to make it through that. And, you know, she was so breathless. But she lived for an extra three years after that. Mm. So she come real good after mm. this spirit, this, mm. the... The power of this place mm -hmm. for mum and and this was is on home. another level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tina, can you tell the story, the commissioner's story? I love the story about how she was when she went into the ambulance compared to how she. Oh was yeah, she so got that. and then when we did lose it, the week we did lose mm -hmm. it, she got very. I had a, um, a, I don't know what it's advanced care plan. If she ever in you know, it was stated, if she ever got sick in Melbourne, we're back and forth to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. If she ever got sick in Melbourne, she was to come home and pass on country. So that got, she got really sick, eh, Joe, and jo, we kissed her all goodbye. She was going into unconsciousness. And she ended up going into unconsciousness in Melbourne, and the, the air flight ambulance said, if she passes on the road, do you want us to stop? And we said, no. We convoyed behind her. Hmm. So she was she was unconscious when she left. And anyway, we was probably crying all the way up to here, eh? Expecting her to be gone by the time we got here. And we got to Hamilton Hospital. That was on the Monday or Tuesday. But before we that happened, the hot, the ambulance said, "What's the plan if anything happens on the way?" Yeah, that's we what just I said, said, "Keep driving, keep, keep going." Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, we get everyone's trying to beat each other there, and we got there, and Mum was sitting up, having a cup of tea, <coughs> eating sandwiches <laughs> yeah. on the bed. Where's that photo? She had one of the bait. Oh, look, it was just hmm. bizarre. Like it was. She got home and she came to life, didn't she? Mm. She got, got so days. much energy and, you know, when you it did it to her, mm. you can feel it. I don't, mm. Even if you're not from here, you can feel the power of this place. I do. Mm. And um, it gave her so much strength. Mm. And it just kept, kept her up for a couple of days so she could yarn to us and laugh with us, eh? Mm. And then she went to sleep. So... I just feel the power of this place is just beyond. Hmm. Well, our great grandmother lived to a hundred, so we had, you know, we lived Longevity. long, long lives, mm. and we're lucky. Grand, you know, she lived till seventy-five; she could have lived longer. Mm. And Mum, she had TB um, because she went into hospital when we were little. We were living mm. in Silver then. Joanne was twelve months old, and our nan from Sydney had to come and get us. But um, yeah, she even, you know, she was sick, and that. Because of um, TB, she was more susceptible to cancer, so, you know, mm. she was sick, poor darling. Mm. And she must have been so, I think you mentioned earlier, 
that fear of TB because of what happened when your grandmother was in hospital with mm. TB. And we didn't go to hospitals. And we didn't get if TB. We, if we were sick as kids, we never got a Panadol. Because if you take your kids sick to a doctor, mum mm. never mm. took us. That was, mm. that was taboo. Yeah. Because think, they remove you. Yeah. I think um, the first doctors was the health service in Gertrude Yeah, Street. it mm. was. That's when we started going to doctors. Mm. I never ha ever had a Panadol growing up. Or an antibiotic or anything. Mm. Mm. That was None of us did. She was very protective. Yeah. Very so because of that trauma from... Mm. Absolutely, the, the and that fear. We never missed school. And and we like, never missed school. Our house mm. was spotless. Our clothes were clean. Mm. We had food on the table. Yeah. All the four things. The pressure that of living you with can't, that. You can't show a little sliver of a chink of mm. being a normal mm. family mm. because that would be enough to be accused of neglect. Our, and our, our and you carry that as a mum. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Every day she carried that, mm. and but you said overprotective. Every, every, every reason, kids. not to yeah. kids. Mm. Every reason to to have that. Yeah. Those fears, and that system still operates because it's a, mm -hmm. who we are as black fellas. You know, it's still that old system that influences the new one, and very people who are the decision makers have those um, biased, you know, that unconscious bias, mm. and you know we're never gonna, mm. you know, we'll, we'll, there'll be no close and no gap. But there'll be no justice either. Yeah. So if there's if the justice is honouring mum and our family and telling her truth, well, that's what Dad wanted for her because no one ever listened to Mum, and that's what the only thing I ever saw Dad upset about was what about your mother? No one knows what happened to her, and he was very angry. Um, yeah, and he he was so upset about her not um, being um, respected or listened to. You know. So for him as well, because he protected her and brought her home. Mm -hmm. So she she lived a good life with her kids and family. It's good. Just yeah. hard for her. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I was trying to fix it. Mm. Mm. Exactly, Tina. Well, well, this is a start. I'm not sure where yeah. we'll go, but we, you know, you've given us so yes. much mm. information. Very good. Yeah, that's uh, a lot to mm. mull over, and it's on the mm. record, so we'll be able to. Look at that and yep. see. Mm. Yeah. But, and we, the young fellas are so good at, like you said, they're, they're organised, aren't they? They, they are telling the truth. And you see that on the 26th mm. of January. Mm. Um, you know, but um, still that privilege exists and, you know, you know how, how are we going to get that justice? I don't know. Mm. I don't want to waffle on, but, mm. yeah. Well, let's um, hope Eunice can get something and... And a, I don't yeah. know what it, that looks like, mm -hmm. but please, somebody yeah. listen to mm -hmm. our story, mm -hmm. please. Mm -hmm. I've got a question on something you raised earlier, which is uh, massacres, and if it's okay, I just want to go there briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're coming back to this, so this is not the last There's time. not one far away from here. Who've been to the convincing ground? Joe, they've okay. been to the convincing ground? They've been to the convincing yeah. ground, and I, I just wanted... I've really got two questions. Uh, one is um, whether your, you and your family are holding stories of massacres, um, um. about where they happened, and, uh, mm. and really the second question, uh, which is wrapped up in the first, is how present are these massacres in your own mind and how much do they affect you? All the people that would know that aren't here. Yeah. But they do know, have that knowledge because there's certain parts of this mission we weren't allowed to go. The and old yeah. people. Mm. And that's our yeah. grandmother. That's it, yeah. Our grandmother, she, yeah. she knew, and mum. Okay. So we knew. Um, and we know where that... And we're still, you know, through... You know, we're digging up um, our ancestors' remains when we build, um, you know, houses and whatever. Mm -hmm. Farmers ploughing their field. Mm -hmm and find yeah. the remains of children and yeah. our families, yeah, yeah, our ancestors. So yes, that's an answer, yes, to both. Yes, OK, thank you. Yeah. Mm. You went a little bit over, off the track coming from the dormitory. Mm. You haven't been to the dormitory yet. Mm. Mm. There was a track that they, mm. they weren't... Well, that, cause Granny Arden lived down there. And you but you went a little off the track. side. There was parts of this mission you can go. Mm. Only baby used that. to be able to hear them crying in the trees here. Mm. Mm. My brothers heard them singing. Mm. Mm. Was, it, was it you two talking about the lights down along 
yeah, me over yeah. around here. Yeah. And they reckon that's the ancestors taking them home to Demar because it's a burial site. But um. We got net nets. <laughs> yes, we had to leave last time before sundown, didn't we? It's when the sun mm. goes we down, just, we had to get out. Mm. All We're things happen out here. Like, you were out of here. I'm like, okay, I'm with you. <laughs> and I just want to say, um, acknowledge our brother who's here today, Joanne's husband, Patrick. Who's, yes, who's, who's, he's our soup team. He's okay. our, <laughs> but he's our brother. <laughs> he's been on the journey and with he, Mum, has not he? Yeah. Paddy. You know, I'll say one thing about beautiful Mum. Uh, as you're talking, Aunt. showed a lot of love to me because I mm -hmm. my mum had the same similar story but I lived it with these girls and the same mm -hmm. so protective mm -hmm. but it was all love she, mm -hmm. she fought the good fight with cold mm -hmm. putting them on people's heads without them ever realising that but it was from her heart mm -hmm. that people did listen mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. yeah. encouraging our mum we're going to be for love the love is shared every time we come here. It's just she raised, so raised good people. Plus, that for me is to come through, come through the washing machine mm. to meet the calm mm. and to express that to my children and grandchildren mm. that they need to know the story. They can hold the pain, mm. Mm. and that's when we start turning into place of one another. Mm. Well, reconciliation, I love it. Mm. She showed me a lot, so. Mm. Oh yeah, she, she loved. Much in this year, but, uh, she loved. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. riled Paddy. She riled all the husbands. Oh, <laughs> this was their home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if, when Mum came down here, yeah. the, she was. This was her home. Yes. And you sat up, mm -hmm. and you didn't. Oh, no. I didn't get away from the country like. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get in the car. And stay in the car. <laughs> yeah, no, she was. Yeah. He yeah. commanded yeah. a certain. Mm -hmm. Thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. We just want the truth about our family to be told mm -hmm. um, as hard as it is and we've just got to honour them and especially for mum mm -hmm. to get her justice and expose the truth that, that she was denied it, um, whoever's responsible She's denied for her it, mm -hmm. is documented in failing our people and then for us it gives us a bit of strength because it's we'll continue that on mm -hmm. and so will the kids. Well, it's going to continue yeah. on through mm. you all yeah. anyway. Mm. I can My nine-year-old tells the story in yeah. class mm -hmm. about stolen gin. Mm. Mm. Stands up. Yeah. Yeah. Ten-year-old. He just does it every year. There you go. Yeah. There you and go. our kids are at school wondering, looking at the flag and saying, where's the Aboriginal flag? But the teachers are challenging their identity. Mm. So this systemic racism, mm. this unconscious mm. bias, mm. because it's our blackness. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm that's important. Mm. 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 Not that fair, I suppose. No, I'm happy to sign off. Yeah. And thank you for all mm. listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've given thank so you. much. So, so much. Our family. Mm. Mm. I need mm. to give some context about Mum to where she gets her fight from, but how hard to bury your lose your whole family, bury your whole, mm. whole family. Mm fight for your rights and your justice and not get that and get still disrespected mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, so insulting and offensive to treat an elder or, or any, all mm -hmm. our elders mm -hmm. like that. She deserves, mm -hmm. mum deserves better. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to sit back and not mm -hmm. then let her get disrespected, especially mm -hmm. now she's gone. And pretend we believe the pissing in the pocket. Yes. Make them feel better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you. thanks, Evan. Thank thanks, you, Maggie. Sue and Tim. I think we need a cup of tea break. Oh, I do. Uh, thank you, Commission Commissioners. Uh, that concludes the video evidence. It leaves. Uh, it remains for me to tender a copy of the video. I will also tender the witness outline and exhibits to the witness outline and they should be added to the tender list and uh, we will allocate them appropriate numbers. Thank you. It'll be done. Well, I think there's a couple of exceptions for pen. Okay. Um, I, I can clarify that, Commissioner Bell. Um, I, I'll sort that out. Um, I do know that we um, 
I, I do seek an order under 26 of the Inquiries Act in respect of identifying information in the case of a third party in the witness outline itself, that's mm -hmm. the body of the witness outline, that includes uh, third party identifying details. Those should be redacted before the um, statement is released. Uh, and I seek that order, uh, but we will also sort out the exhibits or attachments. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, is that an appropriate time for a break? We will resume at 2 p.m. with the next witness. Thank you.